Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nalan Weehard. You're watching the Nalan Weehard Show. My website is www.crystalkidsradio.com. You can check out archives and thank you for subscribing to my YouTube channel or for liking my Facebook page, Nalan Weehard. Today, I have a special guest by the name of Andrew Collins. He is a popular writer of history, archaeology, and science. His discoveries have led to several thought-provoking books that challenge the way we think about the past. He has a new book called Atlantis Caribbean and the comet that changed the world. I just finished it, just on time for the interview. This is his book. It's wonderful. It is thought-provoking read. It's great. It's a must read, ladies and gentlemen. And I have many questions about his book, such as, where is Atlantis? There is much speculation to the myth that the great writer Plato wrote about. So let us hear about Andrew's opinions on the topic. I would like to introduce him to the show. Hello, Andrew. It's an honor and pleasure to interview you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me on the show. Yes, it's a pleasure. Let me begin the interview with the start of your career. Now, what inspired you to write books? Um, well, I've always had an interest in the ancient mysteries subject, and uh, it was something that was probably put into perspective uh, last weekend when I went to uh, London for the 50th anniversary of the release of the book Chariot, Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken. Uh, Eric was there, he's now in his 80s, um, and when that book first came out, mm -hmm. uh, I read it in the 70s, and I mean, it, it changed my life, really, because it made me think about all of these ancient places in the past, everywhere from Stonehenge to the Great Pyramid to the Nazca Lines, mm -hmm. and made me, you know, wonder who it was that constructed these um, incredible monuments, but also why they constructed it. Now, although he came to the conclusion or suggested that they may be aliens, um, I felt that there were more prosaic answers to this and that it related to unknown knowledge of our ancestors. Uh, and that's what's driven me on uh, since the 1970s. And Atlantis was one of my favourite subjects. Um, I felt a connection with it and I felt I wanted to try and find its uh, location. Uh, and I was given the opportunity uh, a few years ago when uh, a publisher uh, agreed to take me on to do a book on Atlantis. Well, at the time, I thought that Atlantis probably was in the area of the Antarctic. Um, there had been popular books by the likes of Graham Hancock, Rand and Re um, uh, Rose Flemath, uh, Charles Hapgood, all suggesting that the Antarctic may have... Uh, played host to some kind of lost civilization. Um, however, my own research very quickly showed me that this was probably not the case and that Plato, who is our main source for the story of Atlantis, uh, quite clearly points you in a different direction. And he essentially suggests that it's somewhere off of the, um, the eastern coast of, of the United States um, and the Gulf of Mexico, somewhere in the vicinity of the Caribbean and the Bahamas. Uh, and the reason why I say this is because, you know, he says he gives various telltale clues. Uh, he says, for instance, that, um, that the Atlantic Empire is made up of a series of islands. Um, and that these islands were used by ancient mariners um, before his own time to reach what he refers to as the opposite continent. Well, I think it should be pointed out that in his day, which was 350 BC, there was no opposite continent. I mean, there was only the ancient world, and surrounding that was what they called Oceanus, which was the, 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 a big river that flowed around. Uh, the world as was perceived at that time and in theory there was nothing beyond it um, but what Plato was saying is that there is or was uh, in his day something else beyond it and that it was a series of islands that linked to a opposite continent well that opposite continent was very clearly the Americas um, and so he seemed to be inferring that he had knowledge of the Americas and the larger islands of that area, 
most obviously Cuba and Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. um, and obviously the, 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 the island groups of the Bahamas, which had previously been one huge landmass um, known as the, the Great Bahama um, uh, well, Bank, basically. But um, it, in the past, it had been all above water um, and it had only really sunk into the manner that we know it today with these thousands of islands and cays um, after the end of the last ice age. And the other important thing is that Plato said that Atlantis was destroyed in a cataclysm, one that took place, he said, around 9600 BC. Um, well, it just so happens that science now has incredible evidence to show that there was a huge cataclysm that took place exactly in the area that Plato indicates, which is essentially the, the, the Western Atlantic seaboard and also the you know, large parts of the, the North American continent. And that this was caused by a comet impact, uh, which meant a bolloid or object disintegrating into hundreds and thousands of pieces that each uh, impacted with the earth creating wildfires um, and a lot of other very bad things which we'll talk about mm -hmm. which blotted out the sun um, for a whole long period of time you know maybe days weeks even years and triggered a mini ice age that lasted for about 1200 years from about 12 10,800 BC and it came to an end about 9,600 BC exactly when Plato tells us that the Atlantis ceased to exist and I find that all far too coincidental for it to be meaningless mm -hmm. um, and I think I suppose the next question has to be is how is it possible that somebody like Plato who was a Greek um, philosopher came across this knowledge. Exactly, yes. So uh, the answer to that is that mm -hmm. reports of the existence of islands uh, and possibly even civilizations and cities uh, and of course the cataclysm itself were probably filtering into the Mediterranean world uh, from ancient voyagers and mariners exactly of the type which Plato refers to in his texts and that these people were probably the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. Um, now these were related, they were sister col colonies um, and they were unquestionably navigating large parts of the ancient world and stretching out um, their fields of, of, of exploration certainly as far as the Sargasso Sea, which is right in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, it's a huge, vast area of seaweed uh, that stretches from the Azor Islands all the way westwards to the Bahamas. Um, and there's re ancient references from the time of, of Plato that talk about these islands and about this, this sea of seaweed um, and these same accounts also talk about uh, very shallow areas, mud shoals as they call them, which are in the vicinity of this sea of seaweed. Well, Plato talks about these as well. And he says that where Atlantis was is where these mud shoals are today. Mm -hmm. Well, they can only be one place and that's the, um, the, the, the very shallow areas uh, that surround all of the Bahamas, I mean, and are notorious for shipping even today. Um, and certainly they, they were not in the vicinity of the Sargasso Sea because we know that that's, you know, thousands of, of, of metres deep at, at that point. So uh, we're dealing definitely, I think, with the area of the, of the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. So what we have to ask is, you know, what exactly went on in the Bahamas and the Caribbean in this distant epoch? Um, well, I think that initially it was probably drowned by some kind of um, super tsunami, 
um, of the type that we've obviously become so familiar with um, in Southeast Asia mm-hmm. in the 2000s and obviously in uh, Japan as well. Right. You know, I mean, these, these super tsunamis weren't totally understood until really the last 20 years. Um, but we now know that they are much more frequent than what uh, science has previously understood. Um, and that quite clearly, if they're caused by a comet impact, you know, a, a fragment of a comet, they could possibly be hundreds of metres in height, possibly even more, and they would drown island land masses like the islands of the Caribbean, temporarily at least, um, this, you know, completely killing all of the, uh, the inhabitants or those that weren't on extremely high ground. And this is exactly the sort of stories that we find from myths and legends that are preserved in the Bahamas and the Caribbean um, and were told to the first European explorers to reach the area at the end of the 15th century at the time of the exploration of Christopher Columbus and the other European explorers. Um, They were told by the indigenous peoples about this great cataclysm that had taken place um, the stories varied, but they, they generally involved a period of darkness, um, the, the flooding of the islands, killing all of the inhabitants. Some talked about this, this snake or serpent that appeared in the sky at the time. Others talked about the moon falling into the water. Um, and others talked about rains of fire and things like this, all of which are very indicative of what we call a cosmic event, an impact event involving most likely uh, fragments of a comet, but of course they could also be either meteorites or or asteroid fragments as well. Mm -hmm. That sounds interesting. I'm looking forward to discussing more about it. But my question to you is, before Lena sank, do you think that people were warned about it? Um, Yeah, I think that they probably knew Mm -hmm. something was happening because obviously you would see in the sky that the comet in the first place, and this would be around for... Uh, months Mm -hmm. perhaps Um, and I think probably from the memory of even earlier cataclysms they would know to keep watch of um, of comets and the biggest problems come I think for comets is when they Mm -hmm. pass around the sun on what's known as the perihelia which is their close approach uh, you know to our our own star the sun And what happens is that they can get too close Mm -hmm. uh, and they can begin to fragment and break up. And and this can put them on a different trajectory once they exit the sun um, and come back into the inner inner solar system. And this is when the Earth, it becomes most vulnerable. Uh, And I think what happened is that these fragments, which probably almost formed almost like a freight train of fragments, um, were, were placed on a directory towards Earth um, and bombarded the Earth over a period of hours, maybe days, um, devastating large parts of the North American continent, uh, but also reaching as far as the, the Old World as well. There's evidence of it in Europe, in the Middle East, uh, and possibly in, in parts of, of Western Asia, uh, as well, you know, nor- and, and you know, northern Europe. Uh, one thing we also know about this event mm-hmm. is that the ash and burnt debris that was sent up into the upper atmosphere by these wildfires, um, which was very toxic, by the way, uh, fell back down to the ground and created a thick layer, which is about eight centimeters deep. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it's even more. Um, that covered large parts of the earth um, and would have brought with it its own problems. And Mm -hmm. this is known today as the Usilu horizon after the place uh, in, um, I think it's either in Belgium or Holland, Holland, it's right on the border, uh, where this was first uh, uncovered. Uh, And it's also been found everywhere around the world from Australia to Egypt, again to the Middle East, um, Russia, Uh, many countries of of Europe, including Britain. Um, And it's also been found in North America, where it's known as the Black Mat. Uh, And also, I understand, in places in Central and in South America as well. So 
it's a universal disaster, a universal cataclysm, um, and one which we are really only now beginning to understand. It's been known about for many years. Um, it's been proposed that the so-called Pleistocene megafla megafauna, you know, the, the big animals that roamed at this time, were all wiped out by this event. I mean, we're talking about everything from saber-toothed tigers, you know, to the mammoth, although we do know that some of those survived uh, th for another few thousand years. Uh, giant sloth, giant cannibals, you know, all the big strange an animals that you know, we learn about as children at school, mm -hmm. uh, they were all wiped out roughly around the same time. And certainly a cataclysm of this nature would not have helped them. Um, but I think that also there was a human um, disaster as well, because, I mean, it's been estimated that as much as 75% of the American population were wiped out at this time. Um, and, and as I said, the, this wasn't something that happened just on one day. Um, it began around 10,800 BC, but continued on for several hundred years afterwards. I mean, this would have been a terrible time to exist in the world. And you can imagine that because of it, we never forgot it. And it would have been passed down in myths and legends from that point onwards. And of course, every time that a comet appears in the sky, everybody would get frightened. Uh, and I think that this would breed its own uh, ways of dealing with these psychological problems. Um, and you'll find all the way around the world rituals and ceremonies that priests and shamans uh, would carry out to try and avert disasters mm -hmm. from being caused by comets. And in fact, some of these rituals were still being practiced uh, in Central America uh, when the first missionaries uh, reached you know, the inner parts of places like Mexico uh, in the uh, early 16th century. Mm -hmm. wow. And what other documents or historical sources can we obtain other than Plato and Matthew with Atlantis? Well, I mean, um, Atlantis' story is almost exclusively that of Plato. Mm -hmm. No other contemporary of his actually names Atlantis. However, um, there are various other sources, uh, contemporary sources to him, classical writers that do mm -hmm. talk about islands, they do talk about them being inhabited, they do talk about their position and you know, their location in the Atlantic. Um, however, they call them something different. That The main name that they use for them, and I'm sure we're talking about the same thing, mm -hmm. is the Hesperides. Mm -hmm. um, Hesperides is, is a, a Latin-based um, name that essentially means something like um, the place of the evening, uh, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere to do with the setting sun, uh, in the somewhere, you know, like islands of the setting sun, if you like. Um, and these Hesperides were thought to exist deep out beyond the ocean river. Um, and in fact, one account which I investigated in detail for the book talks about them being reached after a sailing journey of 40 days from the African coast. Now, if you follow out from the African coast for that period of time, it will take you only to somewhere like the, 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 the Greater Antilles, you know, um, Cuba, um, Puerto Rico, or whatever, or the Lesser Antilles, um, or obviously the Bahamas. And in fact, it took Christopher Columbus and the vessels that went with him very similar periods of time uh, to reach the Bahamas and the Caribbean during their own journey. So we can be pretty certain that this is a reference to them. Uh, and I, I did considerable research to look into this and to find out where these sources came from to follow their courses, um, you know, along the African coast before they would then turn away and go into the ocean itself. And it all seems to be correct. Um, and Plato describes in detail the main island of Atlantis, what I call its flagship. Um, and this had, according to him, like a, some kind of city, um, and it had plains with, which were irrigated. Um, there were vessels coming from other parts of the ancient world into a harbour uh, there. Now, 
although archaeology has not found anything like this, uh, not it, not actually on land at least, uh, the description that he gives of this island matches very closely that of Cuba. Um, and I, I am pretty certain that this is the island, the main island that uh, that Plato was actually describing. Um, and Cuba is somewhere which is very underexplored. I mean, probably because it, it has been under, you know, sort of um, communist uh, rule for the last um, 60 odd years. Uh, that people haven't really taken a lot of interest in it because either they don't want to promote a communist country or they haven't got access to it. I mean, it's it's very difficult for, let's say, American citizens um, to to do work in, in Cuba. I mean, obviously, everything is changing now. Uh, and I believe that in the future, you there will be a number of expeditions to look for underwater ruins off of the coast of Cuba, um, because I think this is where the you know the the the, the, the mother load is, if you if you might want to call it that. Um, I mean, we already know that there are a large number of underwater ruins to be located off of the coast of islands in the Bahamas. I mean, and some of these are extremely impressive, uh, and quite likely will date back to the age of Plato's Atlantis. Um, but we haven't even touched the the similar coastal waters of Cuba yet. I mean, in the year 2000, there were reports of a, an underwater city being found off the west coast of Cuba. The unfortunate thing is, is that it was so deep that it would have cost, you know, literally millions of dollars to have investigated the site properly. Um, and the company involved, a salving company uh, from Canada, mm -hmm. tried to raise the cash through an exclusiv exclusivity deal. And eventually it fell through. Um, so unfortunately, that they could not take the matter any further. Um, but, you know, one day maybe we can investigate this, you know, this discovery, uh, plus new ones that will unquestionably come up in this region. In Atlantis, what food do you believe they ate, and how was their lifestyle? Um, well, I, I don't think it was as Plato describes. I mean, what he describes is something that, that looks the major cities in, um, you know, in, in the Mediterranean world. Um, however, I, I think that what we know is that there was high culture existing uh, in the area of the of Central America. Um, and the north, northeastern shoulder of, of uh, South America, uh, and even uh, in places in, in the United States, um, there was you know evidence of, of high culture as early as, as 9, 10,000 BC. Um, and I think that he is referring to this, but I also think that he's getting some kind of information relating to some of the cities that existed in Central America and South America, most obviously Peru uh, and Mexico. Um, and this was probably reaching the Mediterranean world via these Phoenician and Carthaginian traders. Um, and one particular civilization which I'm certain influenced his Atlantis account is that of the Olmec. Uh, the Olmec people of Central America. Um, I mean, they were a, a very cosmopolitan culture. Um, and I mean, if you look at the reliefs and statues, you'll see the faces of Africans, of Middle Eastern people, Arabic people. Um, you'll see the faces of people from um, the Pacific, uh, from Southeast Asia. Uh, as well as obviously indigenous peoples from Central America. Um, and all of these people may well have been mixing together with, within the, the, the Olmec civilization. And that suggests trade over a very long distance, mm -hmm. uh, one that was stretching out across the Atlantic, but also one that was probably stretching out uh, across the Pacific as well, uh, with links to places like Vietnam, uh, China, Japan, places like that, and of course India.
Um, you know, we, we, we underestimate just, ha just how easily the ancients were able to move around using maritime, um, you know, exploration, maritime vessels. Because I think that this is something which, you know, w w was going on probably even tens of thousands of years ago, let, let alone, you know, 10,000 years ago, and let alone, obviously, prior to the age of Plato. Because ultimately, all it would require is for knowledge of transoceanic journeys in the age of Plato himself. And of that, that seems to be absolutely overwhelming, as, as I give ample evidence in the book. Mm -hmm, definitely. And wasn't there like an interaction between like, for example, Egypt and Mexico? Because like the pyramids of Egypt and the pyramids in Mexico look very similar. Don't you agree? Uh, yes, certainly. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there is a large number of comparisons that can be made mm -hmm. between the cultures of the Americas uh, and the, the old world. And um, this was something that was done originally by a great writer on Atlantis by the name of Ignatius Donnelly. Um, he was an American congressman and a very, very clever, uh, knowledgeable man. Uh, and he wrote a book called Atlantis, the, the Antediluvian World, which was published for the first time, I think in, I think it was 1882. And this drew together all these comparisons of everything from plants to animals to um, reliefs to statues to pyramids to types of architecture and he suggested that they all must have must have come from some kind of mother civilization um, and that this mother civilization was plato's atlantis and he placed the location of atlantis in the middle of the atlantic um, in the area of what is today the Azores um, and he proposed that this is where we would find evidence of Atlantis. Well, now we know that this cannot be because the islands of Atlantis are, are coming up from the ocean, not going down. Um, they're, they're, they are new uh, in geological terms and, and they are being pushed up by the volcanic actions that are taking place along what's known as the, 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 what, the Great Rift of, of the Great Atlantic Ridge. And no real evidence of high civilization or high culture has been found in, in the Azores or on the Azores, other than some slight evidence that the Phoenicians actually reached there and the Carthaginians. Some of their coins and other artifacts have been found on the Azores. So all that we have from this area is further evidence that the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians were reaching much further than orthodox history tells us. How were drugs used in the ancient times and is there any proof to confirm that they did? Yes, now there's a lot of evidence that there was trading in drugs going on in prehistory. Um, and this can be found, for instance, by the discovery of everything from tobacco to cocaine in mummies that have been found in various parts of uh, the ancient world, most obviously Egypt. Um, there was a, a lot of uh, news stories in the 1990s about a European scientists um, finding cocaine inside mummies and although this story would seem to have died a death um, I can say with certainty that the work that this scientist uh, did whose name was Svetlana Balabanova that's it, um, is real is genuine it has not been disputed um, it has not been uh, found to be a hoax or a you know, contamination or anything like that, and that new work is being conducted at the moment into this very area, um, and that we should expect, you know, further reports soon. Um, so you have to say to yourself, how the hell can cocaine reach Egypt in the first millennium BC? Um, and again, this is something that I try to deal with in, in great depth in the book, um, and I conclude that 
again, it was probably Phoenicians uh, and Carthaginians bringing it back across the Atlantic, most likely from Mexico, um, where it was being traded from Peru via Colombia uh, into Central America um, and reaching the markets of the, of the Olmec civilization. And it was then being picked up and exported out from there. Now, the other alternative that I, that I gave in the book is that it could perhaps have come across the, the Pacific Ocean um, and reached perhaps somewhere like China um, and then been taken overland along what we know as the, the Silk Road, uh, which is not a correct term. I mean, it suggests that it was only used for the transportation of silk. But the Silk Road, which reached from China right the way through Central Asia into Western Asia uh, and actually comes to an end um, on the borders between um, what is today Turkey and Syria, uh, was was somewhere that you know was, was a a method of of getting goods from China all the way into the Middle East, and then it's only obviously a very short journey from there into Egypt, and this is all very likely. I mean, another possibility is via India. Um, I mean, there was definitely trade between India and the Middle East. Um, Sea, via the sea routes, by via the, the the Gulf of 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 Iran, you know the um, the Arabian Gulf, um, and you know again only a short distance from there into Egypt. So there are very, very many ways that cocaine could have reached Egypt, and the reason why I focus on it so heavily is because if this can be proved, then it does show that the stories relating to these cataclysms and the disappearance of Atlantis mm -hmm. could so easily have reached the Mediterranean world um, at the time of Plato, which was around 350 BC, which is relatively late on in the day, really, because, I mean, by that time, as I said, the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians were almost mm -hmm. certainly exploring almost the whole world. Um, I mean, everywhere. I mean, they, they were very adventurous people. And the important thing is that they kept everything a secret. I mean, they, they would go to great lengths to make sure that their rivals did not know where they were going. I mean, there's one story, for instance, one of the classical writers states that on one occasion, a Carthaginian boat saw that it was being tailed by a Roman vessel. So what it did was it scuttled the boat, it sank the boat, um, and all the crew had to fend for themselves. Um, and finally, when the captain got back to Carthage in North Africa, he was actually rewarded mm -hmm. um, and paid the, the price of, of his vessel and the goods that it was carried because this preserved the secret of where that vessel was going and this was something that was quite normal um, within the Carthaginian world because you know they did not want anybody else to know where they were getting their goods uh, and I think that when we hear that Christopher Columbus um, discovered mm -hmm. the the new world I think what we should be saying is that Christopher Columbus was the last person to discover the new world you have some interesting points. And I would like to ask you, a lot of people have wondered, how large is this Atlantis? Plato says a number of different things, um, some of which are contradictory. Um, but at, at one point he says that it's as large as Asia and Africa combined. Wow. Now, I mean, if you took that literally, it would suggest a, uh, a continent that was that, that would not even fit in the Atlantic Ocean. It's ridiculously large. Um, but I think that the words that he uses in the original Greek, which a number of people have looked at, does suggest that what he means is the empire of Atlantis. In other words, the extent 
of Atlantis. And uh, what he's probably talking about is the distances relating to islands. Um, in other words, the, 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 you know, the, the influence of Atlantis, because what he suggests is that Atlantis uh, and the Atlanteans had influence even inside the Mediterranean. Um, and that one of their downfalls was the fact that they became too uh, haughty and decided to attack the people inside the Mediterranean as far as, as Italy. Um, now, of course, there's no real um, you know, archaeological evidence of this, but it does show that Plato believed that the Atlantean Empire stretched almost across the Atlantic as far as the Canary Islands and, of course, uh, the very edges of Spain. So I think that that's what he meant. But then separately, he describes the Atlantic island, as he calls it, uh, and the city uh, in the island. Um, and this can be no more than a couple of hundred miles in length. Uh, and so this is a great contrast to this other description about Atlantis being the size of Asia and Africa combined. And as I mentioned previously, I think that there's good evidence to suggest that his main Atlantic island, you know, in other words, you know, the true Atlantis is probably Cuba. Um, but I mean, I single that one out because that one seems to fit the evidence best. But I think that the, the empire itself is all of the Caribbean and the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that the sunken lands, the sunken lands of Atlantis are those of the Bahamas, um, where we, where today all we have, all we can see is the, the many small islands uh, and caves. Whereas in the past, as I mentioned earlier, this was all one huge great land mass that was well above sea level. Um, and there is lots of underwater ruins in this region that, uh, that, tell us that something was going on here many thousands of years ago and that the deeper uh, these ruins are the more obvious it is that the Bahamas was occupied as early as 9 to 10,000 BC. Can you please be so kind to tell us what are the roots of the word Atlantis and where did it come from? The, the, the origin of the root Atlantis, mm -hmm. uh, well Atlantis itself means something like daughter of atlas mm -hmm. now atlas was obviously a greek god uh, he's most known for the fact uh, that that he was tricked into holding the um the the the, the globe of the earth uh, or some suggest even you know the, the heavens itself as a ball on his shoulders um and it would seem that for ancient mariners or voyagers leaving the Mediterranean via the Pillars of Hercules, mm -hmm. which are mentioned in the Atlantis account, that if you sailed around the African coast, the final thing that you would see uh, before you either went further south or then went deeper into the sea itself was a huge mountain known as Mount Atlas. Uh, and it was said that this was the frozen God himself uh, holding, you know, the, the, the globe, the sphere of the earth or the heavens on his shoulder. Um, so this was a very important landmark for, you know, ancient sea voyages um, and something that every sailor, every voyager, a mariner would be very much aware of. Uh, and because of that, the sea... In other words, the part of the, the, the ocean river before them became known as the Sea of, At of, of Atlas, the, the, the Atlantic Sea. Now, we know it today as the Atlantic Ocean. And, of course, the actual term has now been extended to include everywhere from, you know, Greenland, um, right the way across, obviously, to the, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and, of course, obviously, right the way down to the area of Antarctica. Uh, but that wasn't the case in Plato's day. The Atlantic Sea was merely the sea that stretched westwards 
from the Pillars of Hercules and Mount Atlas westwards into the ocean in the direction of the setting sun where the islands of the Hesperides were to be found. Um, and it's, you know, it's only more modern conceptions that's changed this idea about what the Atlantic Ocean actually is. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. of the Pillars of Hercules to the west of Mount Atlas in Africa, uh, and that once again brings us in the area of the, the Bahamas and, the, and the, the Caribbean. Right, definitely. So let's get into the, the Cuba. Let's find out more about this. Could you please be so kind to tell us about like the caves of Cuba and the autumn of these caves? Please? Right, right. Now, I mean, obviously, Plato provides us with account of what was going on in the Atlantic, which for us is all to the west. Well, a very similar story is told amongst the native peoples of Mesoamerica, uh, Central America, you know, the Aztec, the Maya, uh, and the various other uh, tribal cultures that achieved states of, of civilization uh, in the past. And they, they talk about a cataclysm, probably the same one, uh, and they talk about their earliest ancestors surviving this cataclysm and coming from an island in the east and finally the survivors reach the mainland and there they they found tribes which go on to, to, to found uh, civilizations and societies um, and what's common amongst these stories is firstly that the leaders of these, um, these survivors uh, took the form of feathered serpents. Um, obviously, we know about Quetzalcoatl, who is one of the culture heroes of the, the, the Aztecs. The Maya have similar feathered serpent heroes. Uh, for instance, Kukulkan um, and also Itzamna. Uh, both of these are variations of this feathered serpent and these are later forms of, of, of much more primordial uh, figures you know that were both half bird half snake um, and these are these are these are symbols probably symbols for clans relating to appearance uh, paraphernalia relating to birds and serpents and things like this um, but they talk about quite clearly about ancestors that bore this appearance in the, the, the ancient past and they came from an island in the east. Now one of the names for this island is, is something like Talapan uh, which means the old red land um, and people have suggested and I do also that this is one of the Caribbean islands. Um, now, if you go to Cuba, the soil there is blood red, um, and although this is not unique, obviously, it is very prominent in the plains, you know, the fertile irrigation plains, um, and that in the southwest corner of Cuba is an island known as the, um, uh, the Isle of Pines, or, or the Isle of Youth, um, and here is a set of seven caves um, with very strange um, petroglyphs, uh, cave art, um, which dates back certainly several thousand years. Um, and I've been there. I, I went there as part of the investigations for the book. And it was going inside these caves of which you know traditionally there are seven that told me that this place was seen as, as a place of the ancestors uh, of Cuba and may well have influenced the stories of this this place of emergence of the ancestors in amongst the, the Mexica the, the you know the the, the the Maya and the various peoples of Central America as they talk about the place of emergence being somewhere called Chikamotok, the Seven Caves, um, and that this is, you know, the place 
associationism associated with this great disaster, this cataclysm, um, and it's out of here that our ancestors emerged. Well, clearly, I don't think that that you know they 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 hid in this cave whilst the the cataclysm passed overhead. I mean, I, I think the, this is an amalgam of of traditions and legends that were built up over thousands of years. Um, but when I was inside these caves the first time and looked at their very strange cave art, which for the most part takes the form of concentric circles that are all overlapping each other, um, which we we have here in Europe, um, we call it cup and ring marks. Uh, and it's been suggested that these cup and ring marks are representations of comets and um, perhaps warnings about comet impacts and things like this and it was it was these ideas as I was looking at the cave art in Cuba that, that made me realize that the people that had created these petroglyphs had similar ideas in mind and that they were leaving behind in an abstract manner a memory of this cataclysm that had befallen the Western Atlantic seaboard, you know, perhaps as much as 11 to 12,000 years ago. And although this sounds like a long time ago, it's not really. Mm -hmm. You know, stories can be preserved across such a long period of time. I mean, for instance, in Australia, there are huge impact craters. Um, and when the first Europeans spoke to the, the Aboriginal peoples uh, about them, they said this is where the great fire fell from the sky. Well, scientific evidence tells us that those craters have been there for 15 or 20,000 years. Um, so, you know, that suggests very strongly that folklore and legends relating to catastrophes can be preserved across such a long period of time. So equally, the same thing can have happened in the Americas and in the Bahamas and the, and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think that the Atlantean race could have been advanced? If so, then do you think the other cultures became advanced because of these people? Well, I think advanced is, is something that could be debated. Mm -hmm. The only thing I will say is that there's no question that North America um, and Central America and the, the Caribbean were the suffered the greatest part of the impact. Mm -hmm. And I think that had that impact not occurred, then it may well be that right. the Garden of Eden, that, that may have occurred mm -hmm. in the Americas and not in the ancient world. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, but because whatever was going on over there was destroyed, that's it. I mean, in other words, you know, mm -hmm. the 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 the, um, the advantage that the Americas may have had on our own ancient world was taken away. It was robbed from them by the cataclysm, um, because the cataclysm did not affect the ancient world as much. Yes, it did affect it. Uh, in the sense that it would have blotted out the sun, um, there would have been toxic rain, there may well have been some air blasts from uh, the, the cataclysm, uh, the comet fragments, um, and, and floods and tsunamis maybe, but they would not have suffered in the same way as the American continent did, and obviously the peoples living there. As mentioned earlier, as much as 75% of the North American population, which was made up mostly um, by the so-called Clovis people, uh, was wiped out at that time. I mean, so, you know, what would have happened if that 75% was not wiped out? Very likely, they would have achieved civilization much earlier than we did in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's possible for history to repeat itself? and? like now, the comic can hit today or in the near future? Are you saying could it? Yes, could it. Definitely. Okay. Um, 
yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think what's so important about um, books like this and those that my colleagues like Graham Hancock, uh, Graham Phillips and, and others are, are writing is that they alert us to the fact that cataclysms like this have taken place in the past. There is good scientific evidence to show that they don't just occur, but they have a huge impact on human society. Um, and that if they occur again, we need to be ready for them. Uh, we need to know how to deal with them. And I think that, that the world is slowly waking up to this fact. Uh, and there is no question that the fragments are, that caused the original cataclysm, uh, you know, 11, 12,000 years ago, some of them are still going around in the, the, the solar system and every so often the earth passes into these fields of debris which of course we see as meteorite falls because you know that they get pulled into our atmosphere they, they burn up and, and we, we go and lay outside and look at the beautiful meteors going over uh, but some of these pieces could be huge uh, lurking out there we don't know that they're there. They could be, you know, very dark in appearance. And we won't have any knowledge that they're on the way until just a few days before possible impact. So we've got to be aware of that. And we've got to know how to deal with that if this occurs in the future. And it will occur. It's just a matter, not if it's a case of when it will occur. Uh, I mean, hopefully it won't be you know, in any of our lifetimes. But, I mean, if you wanted to do it on a scale of hundreds of years, I would say over the next thousand years, it, it's extremely likely that there will be, be, I don't know. I mean, remember, in 1908, there was an impact event in, at Tunguska in Siberia. Um, and this was just one tiny fragment. And this levelled an entire forest uh, and just thank God that nobody was actually living in that area. Nobody was actually killed. I mean, oh. if, if that had passed over 60 minutes earlier, it would have hit St. Petersburg and it would have, uh, it would have killed literally millions of people. Um, so, you know, that's how close we were to a major cataclysm as recent as 1908. Uh, and obviously there have been other impact events, quite minor ones in the Arctic um, within the last hundred years. Uh, I think there was one in Peru, I seem to recall, uh, within the past few years. Um, and I'm sure there are, there are others that fall into the ocean that we don't really get to know about because once they hit the water, they may, call us, uh, they may cause a, a tsunami. Uh, but other than that, we won't hear that they've occurred. So we just have to be prepared for it, you know, and books like Atlantis in the Caribbean, um, you know, they help to, to, to raise people's awareness about what these things did in the past, how we remembered them through stories like Atlantis um, and why we should be aware that these things can happen again. And in many ways, that's exactly what Plato was trying to say with his Atlantis story. Um, what he was saying is that he was looking at his own um, nation, which was the, 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 the nation of Athens, who during his day were becoming quite haughty, quite arrogant. Um, and he, it, the Atlantis story that he wrote was almost a warning to them to say, look, these people called the Atlanteans were destroyed in the past for the same reasons that you will be unless you change your ways now um, and whether people understood that's what he was trying to do or not I don't know but certainly we can perceive that in his writings in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And another person is that maybe I want to mention is Edgar Cayce he had readings on Atlantis can you please elaborate for the audience? Yeah yeah I mean you know, Edgar Cayce put Atlantis onto a whole new level. Um, I mean, he described not just a very um, complex civilization, but he suggested that they had 
incredibly advanced technologies as well. Crystal technology involving lasers um, and that they could, you know, they had, um, you know, genetic engineering and, and all sorts of, of different technologies that we we're only developing today. Now, we cannot confirm any of that. Uh, all we can say is that here and there, elements of Edgar Cayce's story suddenly becomes true. I mean, firstly, he predicted that one of the remnants of Lost Atlantis would rise, in other words, be found in the year 1968 or 1969. Um, now, it was in, I think it was in 1968, that the Bimini Road was discovered. Now, this is this massive um, J-shaped structure, archaeological feature of the northwest coast of North Bimini in, in the Bahamas. Um, now, I've, I've dove onto this site. I've seen it on more than one occasion. I've been present when similar structures to the Bimini Road have actually been discovered. Um, and I've also dove on to other similar structures um, very close to the Cuban waters at a place called Quesal. Um And these are very interesting sites. And Casey predicted the discovery, I think, of this. Plus, he also believed that the final remnants of Atlantis were the Bahamas and the Caribbean um, and pointed for clues in the direction of Cuba itself, something that I was very much aware of when I was writing my book and of course have acknowledged uh, Casey's contribution to this subject. But I mean, the Atlantis that he described, I think can be said to be an Atlantis of the heart. It's okay. somewhere that you believe in it's somewhere that just occasionally overlaps with reality and science um, and that you know you have to take a leap of faith to immerse yourself in Edgar Cayce's vision of Atlantis and that's good because there's a lot of good morals uh, and ideas there which in many ways science is actually catching up with I mean he, he predicted for instance the whole use of, of laser technology um, he described that as having taken place yeah, in Atlantis. Any proof to confirm that Atlantis ever existed? Like, is there any surviving fragments? And what is the new underwater discovery? Well, okay. You're asking what is probably the, the, the best evidence for Atlantis ever existing. Um, well, we, we certainly haven't got any underwater ruins that... that have a sign on them that say this is Atlantis. There is nothing like that that has ever been discovered. Uh, and of course that the skeptics can always seize upon and say, you know, Atlantis is a fiction of our imagination. But as I've tried to point out in the book, I, I don't think that Plato was given an exact account of Atlantis. He was using stories that were entering into the Mediterranean world and creating a fictional account because his dialogues ultimately are fiction you know they contain lots of scientific information but they are ultimately the x-files of their day ultimately um, and this was the same of it with Atlantis you know he uses what information he's got to create this story of a, of a utopic world that is destroyed because it becomes too haughty, because it gets too big for itself. Um, and he tries to use this uh, as an example to show that unless his own nation of Athens change their way, this is what will happen to them. They will be destroyed by Zeus in the same way as Atlantis in one night and day of, of, of earthquakes and floods. But beside, but, but once you interpret his his information and you are led into the area of the Bahamas and the Caribbean you find that good people have been doing work for years mm -hmm. looking at underwater ruins in this region some of which are incredibly enigmatic and belong to high culture uh, and 
arguably could be as old as Atlantis. So in other words, they, these could be remnants of the real Atlantis. I mean, for instance, my colleagues um, Greg and Laura Little um, have over the, the last um, 15 years been uh, investigating sites in the Bahamas, uh, including one very enigmatic site called Brown's Ruins. Mm -hmm. um, Brown after the name of the, 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 the surname of the people that, that found it. Now this is a massive area of, of stones, of huge blocks, many of them cut and dressed, and of a type of stone that's not indigenous to the Bahamas. Um, it's, it's a type of blue schist, mm -hmm. um, which is not, it, it, I mean, it, it doesn't um, exist naturally uh, on the surface. It's thrust up from deep underground by uh, volcanic or seismic activity um, and you know sort of can only be found in certain places I mean the nearest sources to the Bahamas is Jamaica um, and Cuba uh, and, the, and there's some on Hispaniola um, but the exact source is not known I mean you know there are other sources in in the ancient world for instance in um, in Turkey I think and also I think possibly in Italy. Now um, this, these thousands and thousands of tons of blocks must have got there somewhere that they, they you know that they, they have they are not naturally in this position. Now they form a huge teardrop shape that stretches towards the south and the impression that you get from it is that something has hit a structure, let's say a building of some kind, and absolutely dis devastated it and pushed all of its boulders towards the south. And it sits on a, sh a shoreline, a shoreline that probably existed about four or five thousand BC, but obviously the, the, the actual structure could be m much older than this. Um, and the best guess that I have is that it was hit by a tsunami um, at some point uh, to cause this. And if this is the case, then there's every chance that this tsunami was caused by this cataclysm of 11 to 12,000 years ago. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very enigmatic structure. I show pictures of it in the book. Uh, I talk about it. Um, I talk about the sources of the rock as well and um, and where they might have come from because they're certainly not indigenous to the location. There is nothing like it in the Bahamas. They, it just shouldn't be there. Definitely. Could you please be so kind to share where people can buy your book, Atlantis and the Caribbean, The Common Life Change World, and your other books as well? Okay, well... Atlant the book is actually called Atlantis in the Caribbean and the Comet that Changed the World. Uh, you, it's available now from Amazon and Barnes and & Noble uh, and of course many other uh, independent online bookstores. Uh, bookstores. Uh, but if you want more information about this book, uh, come on to my website which is andrewcollins.com. That's andrewcollins.com all as it sounds. Uh, and I have literally dozens of articles about Atlantis that will give you more information about Plato's story, about the different candidates for Atlantis, uh, and why I believe that Cuba is the flagship of Atlantis. Mm -hmm. So can you please tell us where your website is one more time? I'm sorry? What's your website for our audience? Oh yeah, yeah. It's My website is Andrew. Collins.com. Yes, and then your social media, you have Facebook too as well? Twitter? Yes, yeah, I mean obviously I'm on social media, but most obviously on uh, on Facebook. Okay, well that's where people can check. Andy. Thank you. And could you please be so kind to tell us about your upcoming conferences? Yes, um, for those that might be in the UK, uh, we have the Origins of Civilization conference that's coming up on November the 12th and 13th. 
uh, we have a large number of um, international speakers oh. there, including uh, Graham Phillips, who I know you, you've interviewed on many occasions, uh, Robert Bouvau, um, obviously myself, Hugh Newman, um, uh, William Henry, uh, Maria Wheatley, and many, many others. It's a great weekend, and you'll learn a hell of a lot if you go there. Um, and it's in London, as I said, November 12th to 13th, and all of the information can be found on andrewcollins.com. Sounds great, and that sounds very exciting. Thank you for coming on to the Naomi Hall Show. It's always an honor and a pleasure to interview you, and I hope to interview you in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to the Natalie Marie Hart Show. I would like to thank everyone for watching. You can also check out my website, www.crystalkidsradio.com for more. Or you can also like my Facebook page, Natalie Marie Hart, or check out my Google Plus, Love, Peace, and Harmony. Love you all.